Hello class, hope everybody's hanging in there, doing well. In this video lecture, I'm going to be talking about chapter 12. We're going to talk about the first half of it. This chapter is broadly titled Violence Against Women, um, mainly because um, it's looking at from a global perspective and at several different levels, um, how, how the patriarchal system that we exist in in this world um, basically uh, not spawns, but uh, allows violence against women and um, how pervasive it is. We've already talked in previous chapters about female infanticide, harassment of girls by peers and teachers, um, uh, genital mutilation, sexual harassment in the workplace. Uh, so in this chapter, we're going to talk about other types of gender-linked violence and, um, you know, things like... Uh, uh, violence against children, violence in intimate relationships, uh, uh, different types of violence that uh, it comes through in terms of entertainment like pornography. Um, and we're going to ex examine how often uh, this type of violence is, is underestimated and underreported um, and therefore remains somewhat invisible uh, in a lot of cultures, including our own. So in terms of organizing ourselves, we're going to talk about um, violence against girls and women, a global perspective, and look at some figures for that. Uh, we're going to talk about specifically violence in the media. Uh, then we'll look at violence in the social media. And then lastly, uh, violence against children. Um, and that'll wrap it up for this video lecture. So I'm going to try and keep this to a, a reasonable amount of time. Um, so here we go. Okay, so if we think about um, violence against women's, women and girls um, from a global perspective, uh, according to the United Nations, um, violence against women is one of the most widespread human rights violations um, across the globe, straight from the book. 35% um, of women worldwide have experienced physical and or sexual um, violence during their lifetimes, but in some countries that number, number is as high as 70%, right? Um, so the pervasiveness of violence against women um, suggests its origins and, um, and the reasons it continues to occur is that it's, it's, it happens at all levels of society. It's actually woven into the fabric of society. Um, so all kinds of uh, scary numbers um, is that uh, like 38% of female homicide victims were killed by their male partners globally. Uh, rape and other violent acts against women are, are, war, are widespread in war zones and refugee camps. Um, and more than 125 million girls and women alive today have been subjected to uh, female genital mutilation, FGM, right? We've already talked about that already in a previous chapter, uh, but it's just another example of the, the global um, problem with uh, violence against women, okay? Um, Now, as, as was mentioned previously, this violence is often justified, condoned, or just overlooked. And um, even though not every woman will experience uh, violence directly, the threat of that violence is part of women's lives, of all women's lives. Um, it's seen as culturally useful by men as a way of controlling uh, women and girls, right? So we have certain societies uh, in, in our world um, that we term rape-prone societies. And this is where um, women have a very low status and there's a high occurrence of rape. Um, so that's a, a, that's a um, negative correlation where the status of women, um, as it uh, is, is lower, the, um, the occurrence of rape against women is higher. So um, we see this 
often um, occurring in places on the globe where, where there's this cultural connection between masculinity and sexual domination and control of women. Okay, so the occurrence of rape is then seen as an expression of masculinity and it's viewed as acceptable as a way to punish and control women, okay? And then uh, related to that, we see this honor-based violence um, that we're gonna talk about. Um, uh, the honor-based violence uh, is mainly seen in terms of the honor killings. Uh, so let's talk about that. So let's talk about um, honor killings. What are honor killings? Honor killings are when um, a woman has um, uh, somehow caused dishonor to her family, um, and this is uh, this is part of this whole idea of honor-based violence against women. Uh, so this is when, uh, in a patriarchal system, um, something occurs. Uh, maybe it's the woman's actions. Maybe she chose not to do um, an arranged marriage. Maybe she married outside of her, her religion or her caste. Maybe she had an affair. Or maybe she was sexually assaulted or raped. These are all reasons that are given for honor killings. That is where the woman is actually killed by um, a member of her family, her husband or, or another member of her family, maybe her father. Um, and this is a way to restore the honor of the family is to kill off the woman. And the UN estimates that 5,000 women are murdered each year in honor killings, okay? And this occurs in countries all over the world, Afghanistan, pa Pakistan, Iran, Egypt, Israel, Lebanon, the UK, the US. Um, in Pakistan, there were nearly 2,000 honor killings from 2004 to 2007, for example, okay? In many countries where these honor killings occur, the laws reduce or eliminate punishment for the men who kill their wives. Uh, if they can prove that it was for one of those these reasons, right? Um, also, we see in countries that are engaged in war or armed conflict, then mass rape becomes a tool of war, um, and um, these uh, this is a way to bring shame on not just the victim but her clan, her tribe, her ethnic group. If they seek treatment, they may be thrown in jail for having sex outside of marriage. And um, we also see that rape is now acknowledged as a war crime. And um, there have been some cases of uh, the International Crimin Court, Criminal Court at The Hague um, uh, convicting um, uh, country uh, leaders for um, rapes in, uh, done by their armed forces during times of war because it's very pervasive. So we... Uh, another example of violence against women and girls uh, that's very pervasive is sex trafficking uh, that goes on all over the world in virtually every country, including the U.S. Um, uh, an example in Southeastern Asia alone, UNICEF estimates that a million children are trafficked into commercial sex work each year. Um, this is a very profitable industry. It's only... Um, only smaller than weapons um, and drug trafficking. Uh, it's the third largest type of trafficking in the world. Um, global estimates are that uh, the profits associated with it are between 30 and 50 billion US dollars, okay? The patterns of this trafficking um, are fairly uh, predictable. The source sources of these um, women and girls are the, are the less developed less wealthy, less stable countries um, who sort of serve as the source sources, source countries. And then the destinations then are the um, countries uh, where uh, there's more social acceptance of the slave trade, for instance, like Thailand, okay? So women and children are vulnerable to this trafficking for a number of reasons. Um, like I mentioned, I mean, we have uh, some, some countries have uh, these great inequities, um, gender inequities, uh, and when you combine that with social or political instability, war, um, and limited choices for families, 
um, you see a lot more sex trafficking. It, additionally, in countries that have suffered from the HIV and AIDS epidemic, um, there's a greater market value for you, very young girls um, because they're virginal sex partners, um, which uh, helps avoid um, HIV for their male partners. There are some efforts to limit to eliminate sex trafficking because it's become such a huge global issue, um, but there's still a lot more resources that need to be put towards um, trying to eliminate the, tra the trafficking. So now we're gonna uh, talk about violence in the media. So we know that violence against uh, women and girls is often normalized or even condoned um, and media coverage of violence participates in this process, right? Um, it de-emphasizes the perpetrators uh, and the violence or its consequences, right? And it's often actually uh, seen as entertainment, um, which is uh, very unfortunate. Um, uh, for instance, there's, there's a recent content analysis of crime-based dramas on network television and it found that white women were more likely to be raped, murdered, or attacked by a stranger on television compared to white men, black men, or black women. However, um, we see on television that um, um, the majority of TV programs and video games contain violence, and usually this violence is portrayed as trivial, justified, or funny. But um, it also causes uh, children to, to, uh, to be desensitized to real violence, and it also builds cognitive schemas of the world as a dangerous, scary place where a person must be aggressive in order to survive, right? Um, and we see this most recently in video games. Video games are the newest technology to teach children to be aggressive. Over 85% of popular video games in the U.S. and Japan contain violent content, okay? So meta-analyses uh, demonstrate that exposure to violent video games uh, is related to increases in aggression in aggressive thoughts, behaviors, attitudes, and actual aggressive behavior, and in decreases in socially positive behaviors, such as helping behaviors, right? Those pro-social behaviors. Um, if you look at longitudinal studies, um, uh, we see that uh, children and adolescents um, who play violent video games um, have uh, increases in aggression, um, months and even years later. Now we don't, this is, these are not causal studies, these are correlational. Um, but uh, it definitely shows that um, the greater exposure to um, aggression can lead to more accepting attitudes towards violence and aggression. Um, and this plays out in terms of gender violence as well. Um, so if you look at how female characters are portrayed in video games, um, first of all, they're rarely portrayed, and when they are, they are often per portrayed as promiscuous sex objects. Um, for instance, in um, Grand Theft Auto, a player can hire a prostitute, engage in demeaning and often explicit sex talk. They can have sex um, virtually with in, within the game and then kill the prostitute in order to get their money back. So very demeaning. Um, uh, violence towards women being normalized, right? Um, so these re these media images definitely reinforce stereotypes of women as weak, as research has shown, and reinforce um, norms that it's acceptable to use force to control women. Um, and research has also shown that this video violent, I'm sorry, this violent video game use is also positively correlated with rape supportive attitudes, right? So a lot of problems here in terms of portrayal of violence and how that affects uh, aggression. 
So pornography, um, let's talk about definitions of pornography versus erotica, okay? So if we want to think about what defines pornography, um, most experts have separated out uh, the notion of pornography uh, from what they term erotica, okay? So if it's pornography, then that's the material that combines um, sex with some kind of violence, dehumanization, degradation, or abuse, right? Typically against women, like 87% of the pornography out there is uh, where it's the woman that's being um, uh, hurt or dehumanized or degraded, right? Um, if it's material that is simply sexually arousing without these other themes present, that's termed erotica by the experts. So they've uh, gone to, a, there's just been a common attempt uh, in recent de decades to try and differentiate pornography from erotica. Uh, regardless, uh, it is pervasive. Pornographic images of women are much more available to everyone in the U.S., than ever before, mainly due to um, the creation of the internet and the World Wide Web. Um, and we see this also reflected in uh, how the, the industry of pornography has influenced our popular culture in the U.S. Oftentimes, um, these images that we see on the World War Web are not just um, images, but actual documentation of sexual violence or humiliation of women. And then granted, some of the women in these pictures uh, may have volunteered for such treatment in exchange for money or other rewards, but many uh, had, may have been coerced as well. Um, so uh, it it's, can be considered a form of violence against these women. And we do know from the research that pornography, more so than erotica, has temporary negative effects on men's attitudes and behaviors towards women, right? Um, and it reflects and perpetuates how our society views women um, in, in, some, uh, in some subcultures. Um, it's a view, women are viewed as objects for men to sexually dominate, right? Um, although there's an argument within among feminists that censoring pornography could lead to censorship of women in general. Um, so we have to be careful about how we um, censor pornography. If it's not, um, uh, if it's not used uh, as a means to uh, exploit and degradate women, um, then maybe it's not wrong on all counts, right? Um, we see things such as sexting um, this is sending sexually explicit photos or videos uh, of, one, of oneself via text message or email. This has become increasingly common amongst teens and adults. Um, and the problem with sexting is that it can be easily forwarded to a much large, larger audience than originally intended, right? So anything you put out on the internet, essentially anything you send digitally, in an email, in a text, wherever it is, it's then on the web once you've sent it, right? So um, this is often can be considered non-consensual por pornography, right? Um, and it's very difficult to, um, to fully remove it ever once it's out there. Now we do see some, um, some uh, laws against this non-consensual pornography um, but only in three states do we see this um, in 2016. By 2000, I'm sorry, in 2013. By 2016, um, uh, we do see that 34 states in the District of Columbia now have revenge porn laws, um, which means that they have laws. If someone is uh, putting this non-consensual pornography out, um, there, there is some way to, um, to, to hold them accountable. Um, and we did also see recently in Congress the Intimate Privacy Protection Act, uh, which would make it a federal offense to distribute revenge porn and would be punishable for up to five years in federal prison. So there's some attempts then to, um, to uh, control some of this non-consensual pornography that gets put out on the World Wide Web. Now I want to mention that it is important to be able to define uh, differentiate uh, these terms uh, 
pornography versus erotica, sexting, non-consensual pornography. Um, so those are items, those are definitions that you want to be sure that you're clear about the meanings. So if we think about um, gender violence against children, uh, child sexual abuse um, is an issue that we have to discuss. Um, we define this as coercive sexual interaction between a child and an adult. Um, according to 2014 data, um, a significant percentage of abuse reports involve sexual abuse of a child. That's 8.3%. Um, and this is occurring, violence is typically occurring within families. Um, we know that uh, if you look at the adult uh, women in the U.S., um, uh, it is likely that over a quarter of them have experienced some sort of sexual abuse during their childhood. And again, this abuse is most likely by someone they know within their, fa their family. Okay. Uh, Because children are small um, and um, dependent on others, they're um, uh, easily victimized. And this can occur uh, by older relatives like brothers or the child's own father or stepfather. Um, these are the typical abusers of girls within the family. Um, uh, abusive families are often emotionally distant and unaffectionate. They tend to be strongly patriarchal. The father is the head of the household, the mother is subservient, and the children are taught to obey without question. Um, and there's also, um, in these families, there's a lot of conflict among family members. Um, before the abuse starts, the perpetrator may get gradually earn the, the child's love and trust by treating her as special. Um, and then the increases, uh, the inappropriate contact is a slowly increased. And um, by the time the child realizes that the behavior is sexual and wrong, it's already part of the established pattern. Um, and the abuser may, um, after each episode, apologize and promise that it will never happen again. However, this is, becomes a cycle of building the child's trust, then making, then having a sexual transaction uh, that's abusive, and then. Um, this uh, may occur over and over. The child is going to feel overwhelmed and nowhere, have nowhere to turn for help. Um, often the children in these situations are emotionally neglected and they're afraid to question the power and the authority of adults. Um, and often the perpetrator may succeed in convincing the child that their relationship is a special loving secret rather than a crime. Okay. Uh, well, many schools now sponsor programs, in, this many schools in the U.S. now sponsor programs to teach children about what's appropriate and inappropriate touch and try to encourage children to tell an adult if someone acts in a sexual way towards them. The problem with this type of approach is the effectiveness is very limited because it what does what? It places the responsibility on the child for prevention, which is so, so um, difficult for the child. Um, we do know that there are some other resources. The Child Abuse Prevention Association does operate a National Child Abuse or Child Neglect Hotline, and they also pr promote a variety of counseling services for family support. Um, and as children progress through schools, teachers, um, and school officials like school counselors um, try to be attuned to signs and symptoms of potential abuse, but it's difficult actually to catch. Um, okay, so that wraps up this first lecture on chapter 12. And the second lecture uh, will start with um, domestic violence.